So, uh, I mean, you've done this so many times, you're probably totally unfazed, but other people get a little nervous once the recording starts. So it, we get sort of comfortable, okay, it's recording and we, we're not nervous that, oh my gosh, okay. And then everybody freezes up, right? <laughs> uh, so is, is there a short bio on your website? I, I don't think I have one actually. Uh, uh, I, I mean, I know you so well, I can just invent the bio live, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> super, I'm so excited. Hi everyone. I have the distinct honor of hosting Professor Armando Solar Lazama from MIT today. Armando is a collaborator I've been working with since I want to say 2017. Does that sound right? Yeah, about. Mm -hmm. well, and Armando has many people consider Armando as the uh, re sort of reigniting the field of program synthesis with the work that he did in his dissertation at Berkeley on Sketch. And he's continued to work on Sketch uh, for several years, and he's expanded into a bunch of different areas. He's uh, all over the place. I think that he's now the head principal investigator of a new uh, NSF expedition center called Understanding the World Through Code. He's someone that I constantly look to as, as an advisor for me in machine programming. He was the second author on the Three Pillars of Machine Programming paper, which is the paper that we use to drive all of the research and engineering that we do at Intel. And with many of the collaborators that I have uh, across the, the world. And basically Armando is uh, just a superhero and <laughs> he probably understands the field of machine programming. If there's, if there's someone in the world that I can think of that I say, okay, this person understands machine programming better than I do. That person is probably Armando Solar Lazama. So with, with that said, first of all, thank you so much, Armando. I know you're super busy and making time for us is just incredible. Uh, I know that you run the computer assisted programming group at MIT. I was wondering if you could maybe start off with you giving a little bit of background about yourself and how you ended up at MIT. Sure. And uh, first of all, thank you for, for the very kind uh, introduction. So uh, yeah, as you mentioned, I, I work on uh, uh, machine programming and, and really broadly, I'm very interested in this intersection of programming systems and AI and machine learning. Um, I think on the one hand, there is a lot of potential for leveraging techniques from machine learning and AI to, to really improve the way we produce code. But beyond that, programming is also very interesting as a test bed for ideas around how to combine symbolic and sub-symbolic uh, reasoning. It's, it's really a canonical example of a high-skill task that requires both trained intuition as well as very systematic, detailed, uh, uh, formal reasoning, and so in that, it's it's really a good uh, it's really a good test bed for trying out ideas about how to uh, make these different forms of reasoning work uh, work together. Now, related to the question of how I got here, I, I basically uh, started out at MIT right uh, fresh out of PhD. From, uh, from Berkeley. Um, I, I was very fortunate that this was really kind of my first uh, job out of uh, uh, graduation. And um, it's, it's been really exciting to uh, build up a, a body of work around these ideas of, of program synthesis that uh, uh, I've been toying with uh, together with my collaborators all the way going back to basically my first semester as a, as a graduate student. That's fantastic. And there's, there, there's so many questions I have based on what you just said, but I wanna start with the one about going straight from doing your PhD at Berkeley 
to a professor at MIT. Now, as you know, I work with a lot of professors at Berkeley and a lot of professors at MIT. And there are maybe a handful of people in the world that I know that can go straight from their PhD to a professor at MIT or Stanford or something, right? So you are in this very small class of people that can do this. What, what is that like? I mean, <laughs> how, how did you make that happen? Well, I guess, uh, you know, imposter syndrome is a thing, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, showing up, uh, showing up uh, as, a, as a faculty member on day one, uh, you know, I'm not going to lie, it is, uh, it is a bit intimidating. Uh, I also, I graduated, uh, uh, you know, I think, I think at the point where I finished my PhD and, and graduated, it was right at the point where people in the community were starting to see that there was maybe some uh, value in the stuff that we were doing, but it was really, really very early uh, still in, in that process. I think all the papers that I had written as a graduate student probably had a total of like 10 citations. And <laughs> half of those were from my friends who... <laughs> uh, Things and, have changed, Armando. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, at, at the time, I would still get questions from people who were like, okay, yeah, the synthesis stuff was kind of cute for your PhD, but what are you really going to do, right? Like, obviously, it would be responsible to have your students work on, uh, on these problems that are so clearly unsolvable. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that was a little bit intimidating, to say, to say the least. But uh, I guess what you do, what you do in those situations, you just take the plunge and, uh, uh, you know, go at it until you get, uh, you start uh, seeing some results. <laughs> That's great. And uh, while you were talking, I just quickly <laughs> looked you up on Google Scholar. So you've gone from 10 citations to you currently have 6,200 citations <laughs> and you have an H index of 37, just in case you were curious. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's fantastic. The next question I have is going back to the answer of your first question is you mentioned some really interesting stuff about uh, neurosymbolic reasoning. And I believe that the, and please correct me if I'm wrong, your NSF expeditions effort, understanding the world through code is largely inspired around this idea of neural symbolism. And I was wondering if you might take a few minutes to kind of explain what neural symbolic reasoning is, sort of how you put these two pieces together of essentially a totally distinct fields, right? And, how now that's working together to sort of unlock new mysteries. Sure. So one of the uh, one of the motivations around that uh, that project was this, this idea that if if your goal is really scientific discovery, there's a lot of settings where you know deep neural networks as they exist today are great and are exactly what you need. But there's also a lot of settings where they're not enough, where it's not enough just to be able to make predictions about some natural phenomena. You really want to be able to understand how things work, right? And now, what does that mean, understanding how things work, right? It's kind of a fluffy concept. Uh, but uh, yes, one is obviously you want to be able to make good uh, predictions, but you also want to be make sure that, for example, that the predictions that you make are consistent with your prior knowledge about the, the field. You want to make sure that uh, you're able to generalize uh, well from those observations to things that are way beyond the uh, the observations that you have uh, that you have made, right? I mean, in, in science, it's not uncommon for uh, people to be able to extrapolate, you know, orders of magnitude beyond the sort of observations that originally gave rise to to a theory, right? And and neural networks are just not so good when it comes to that level of of extrapolation and that level of of generalization, and so. 
that suggested that we do need some level of symbolic reasoning in there. However, neural networks also have lots of advantages. They are able to capture really, really complex phenomena. They can leverage uh, parallelism and they can leverage uh, the power of GPUs very, very efficiently uh, in a way that a lot of our symbolic reasoning strategies uh, cannot. And so the question around this project is how can we develop new learning techniques that can give you the best of both worlds and that can combine the great capabilities that we have for symbolic reasoning with the capabilities that you get from deep learning. And it turns out there's no single answer to this. And uh, one of the things that we have been doing is actually building a, a taxonomy of strategies and combinations of, of models that are useful for different ways. In some contexts, for example, you really want to leverage the ability of deep neural networks to associate meaning with very, very unstructured uh, inputs and very unstructured information. In other cases, you want to leverage their ability to learn very complex conditional distributions over uh, symbolic artifacts, for example. And, uh, and so really finding the right combination that is good for a particular application and more importantly, really being able to build a methodology that allows you, when you look at a problem, to say, oh, this is the combination that we need for, for this problem. That's what we are after. Uh, so it, it, one thing that I, I always have found interesting with you and your work, and part of the reason why I really wish you would take a vacation, is many of the times that my team or I come up with ideas, we then, you know, they'll say, oh, we should do this. And I said, yeah, Armando did that in 2017. And <laughs> they'll say, well, we should do this. Armando just published this in NeurIPS uh, just six months ago. And so <laughs> uh, just, you know, for just for the community, if you would take a, a summer off, maybe, you know, that <laughs> would help the rest of us just a little bit uh, with, with us being uh, <laughs> not as fast, <laughs> not as bleeding edge as you. Uh, but yeah, I think what you said about the neurosymbolic systems and the, the different advantages is, is dead on. And in fact, one of our collaborations that we didn't quite complete was we were trying to combine Autoperf with Polaris. And we wanted really the understandability of the, the stochastic system that we had in Autoperf. And we could do it, I think, for small inputs. But I think that like you pointed out, one of the challenges with neural nets is understandability can be um, something that we maybe haven't fully mastered yet. We're, I think we're starting to make strides in that space, we're doing things like formal verification of neural nets, like the work that Guy Katz is doing, Clark Barrett and others, but there's still a lot of work to do in that space. So, yeah, and I think a lot of it, uh, you know, understandability or explainability is one of these uh, uh, terms that it, it really depends on the context, right, and on what you want. So, so for some, uh, understandability is generally never a, an end in and of itself, but rather it's, a, it's an instrument for, for other goals. For some things, what you really care about is verification, right? You, you really care that I want to be sure that the network is going to do the right thing, even in this corner cases that might not have trained for. And I think for that, there, it is very reasonable to expect that, that eventually we will be able to verify, at least for certain kinds of networks and for certain kinds of properties, that we'll be able to verify and make sure that, yes, it, it does the right thing for, for this particular application. Or at the very least, we'll find ways to make sure that it's used in a context where when it gets it wrong, there's, there's a fail safe there that, that can protect you. But there are other reasons why people like understandability that sometimes might not have anything to do with, um, with verification. For example, one really big one is counterfactuals, right? So 
if you have a neural network that is trained end to end, here are some inputs, I get some outputs. You can ask what if questions that say, well, if I change this thing about the input, right? What's going to happen? If, uh, if the network really did learn the right uh, thing, then presumably it's, it will actually tell you, yeah, if you change this input, this is what's going to happen. And if you change this other input, this is what's going to happen. But if the network doesn't capture the structure of the process that, that is going on in the middle, then you cannot talk about interventions about what's happening in the middle. So to make this very concrete, right? We, uh, one of the domains that uh, we are starting to look at is in computational biology, we're looking at RNA splicing. So at, at a very, very high level, what you have is you have a sequence of RNA and you want to predict how the molecular machinery that is inside your nucleus, the nucleus in your cells, is going to uh, interact with this RNA sequence and essentially chop it up into pieces and reassemble it. So you can train an end-to-end -end model. You can train a neural network to predict very, very accurately for a particular sequence of RNA exactly how these machinery is going to process it and what is going to be the outcome, right? And so I can then use this to say, uh, you know, to make virtual experiments to say, oh, if my RNA sequence looks like this, what's going to happen? And if it looks like this, what's going to happen? But because the network doesn't know anything about the process, right? There's, or presumably it knows something about the process, it has captured what this process is doing, but because the process is not explicit in the network, I cannot go and ask, okay, what would happen if I were to uh, remove this particular molecule exactly. from, uh, from the molecular machine? Or what would happen if I double the concentration of this molecule? Because that's something that the, the model Precisely. doesn't even uh, understand. It's not captured in the model at all. Yeah. It yeah. Uh, presumably the, the model has figured out how these mechanisms work. Hopefully, maybe it's just uh, uh, making uh, correlations that don't actually generalize, mm -hmm. but it's certainly not letting you make these interventions that you would actually know uh, what they do. And, and this is where having models that are neurosymbolic that have, uh, that look more like traditional programs that have a, an explicit relationship to, to the process that you're trying to model can be so valuable. Yeah, and the truth is uh, many of the systems that we're starting to build are actually neurosymbolic systems and principally for the, the reasons you just described. Uh, I think neural programming is wonderful and fantastic, but one of the big hurdles, as you pointed out, is, well, what happens then if you start suddenly getting the wrong answer? Whereas if you have a neurosymbolic system, it's entirely possible that for one embodiment, that that's, uh, symbolism may be in the form of code. And now we can look at that code and say, oh, the bug is here. I'm just going to change this one line and now it works. Whereas if it's a neural program solution, you have a neural network and then it's like, okay, I guess I have to retrain the whole thing and augment the data and then cross my fingers and hope that now it's gonna get the right answer. So I think that that is a, a great reason for sort of fusing these two together. But yeah, I think the key is that even if you, even if the net, the model does not make a mistake, right? Even if the model really is giving you the right answer and doing the right thing in every case, a lot of times you still want to ask questions about, you know, right. what if this and what if that and what would happen if I were to change things in this way or in that way, mm -hmm. right? And, and if the model doesn't capture those internal mechanisms in a way that yeah. they can be intervened, mm -hmm. then, uh, then you cannot ask these, uh, these sorts of questions. Yeah, I love it. It's, it's like it allows for more scientific exploration, right? than if you didn't have that capability. The, the whole uh, question asking piece, I think can be really important, especially as scientists, as we're exploring a space that maybe we don't fully understand. And you know, as, 
as a, obviously someone that's really well established in research, I think one of the first things we do is we come up with a hypothesis. And then we say, well, let's test this hypothesis. And if there's not a way for you to very easily put that hypothesis into the system to then see what happens, I think it can be a bit of a showstopper. Uh, so yeah, one, exactly. Yeah. So one other question I had for you, actually, to roll way back is, you know, you mentioned that you've been working on program synthesis since the beginning of, I think, grad school. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so what was the driver? What what led, okay, so here you are, I mean, today, I know you're all over the place. You work probably in a, a dozen different domains, although I think you still have a very strong principally rooted in machine programming and then it in all these different flavors. But at the time, there are so many different things you can look at. What pulled you into program synthesis over um, studying like programming languages or software engineering or uh, electrical engineering, something of that nature. So when I started as a PhD student, I, I actually started working in high performance computing. This uh, and uh, I started wor working in uh, Kathy Yellick's uh, lab at, uh, at Berkeley. And this was actually a pretty exciting time in sort of the intersection of programming languages for uh, and, uh, high performance computing. There were a lot of uh, new efforts around developing new programming languages for high performance computing at, at Berkeley. There was uh, UPC, there was this language called Titanium. And there were these efforts at Cray and IBM. But one of the things that struck me was that in, in a lot of these cases, the, the, the approach was, okay, we need to build the right abstractions. We need to uh, build uh, uh, really good compilers. Um, but oftentimes when you're having to write some of these very complex uh, algorithms, there, there are certain things that are just hard uh, that, uh, you know, the, the language can help you with making the housekeeping easier and help, it, it can help you reduce the syntactic burden of, uh, you know, setting up communication and it, the languages could do a lot for you. But at the end of the day, you still have to figure out how to write a distributed algorithm, right? And you still have to figure out how to organize your computation so that it, it runs efficiently. And that seemed like a really hard thing to completely automate away. And it was easy. It seemed like there, uh, a lot of the traditional techniques could lead you into a situation where you could have languages where you could write very nice, clean, high level programs, or you could write very high performance programs, but they couldn't be the same program. Uh, right. There seemed to be sort of this trade-off between how cleanly and how nicely you write the program and how uh, performant it is. And so that's when I started talking to uh, uh, Ras uh, Bodic, and uh, it turned out that he was also really interested in, uh, in this question. And he had some really interesting ideas about, well, what if we can sort of give the programmer some tools to allow them to control how things are going to be compiled and more generally how they're going to be manipulated internally by the, by the compiler so that uh, you can escape this trap of, of having to choose between writing something cleanly and writing something uh, that, that is efficient. And so we started collaborating, we started working together and the very first domain that where we decided to experiment with some of these ideas is what is arguably the 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 most boring uh, and uh, <laughs> uninspiring domain that you could imagine. We're basically <laughs> trying to do bit twiddling, um, <laughs> and uh, but actually it turned out to be a great uh, thing because even though. And Armando, it, just for the audience, can you explain what bit twiddling is? <laughs> you know, basically, we're looking at these programs that are manipulating streams of data at the bit level and that are doing like bit level permutations. And uh, 
the, the canonical example we would use for uh, talks would be like, if you want to drop every third bit in, in a stream of bits, uh, turns out to actually be a really hard thing to do. And it's the sort of thing that, uh, you know, if you write high level code for this, no compiler would ever try to, to optimize it. Uh, partly because so few people care about this that uh, it's probably <laughs> even worth for the compiler to do it. But also, as it turns out, it's just hard. It's, it's a hard uh, uh, thing to, uh, to optimize. And, uh, uh, but it turned out to be a really good domain, a really good vehicle to, to try out uh, certain ideas about how you could control the, uh, the compilation process and manipulate these programs in a way that, uh, you know, trying to do this for, for more uh, uh, realistic domains uh, as a first step would have probably been very hard. And at the same time, it is a domain where there are important applications, things like ciphers and error correction codes mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that really do depend on these Right. level manipulation so so it had this actually nice combination of both being tractable but also allowing you to to write things that yeah. uh encryption that algorithms are, are very useful. much driven by this yeah mm -hmm. yeah 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 and uh, and so basically that's where we all got started but i remember the very first paper i wrote um uh it was pldi 2005 um, we actually got uh, a best paper award for oh wow uh, for that paper, and I remember I was an intern at uh, I was an intern at IBM that summer, and uh, I remember sort of eating my lunch in the cafeteria, and then I'm overhearing this conversation from another table, uh -huh. and so I all of a sudden hear somebody ask, "Hey, you know, how was PLDI? You know, who uh, who got the the best paper award?" <laughs> And then this person says, yeah, it was really weird. They gave it to this paper on bit twiddling. Like, who cares about bit twiddling? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And you're kind of like, um, yeah, that's my paper. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, yeah, I'm actually looking up your papers over here. I take it that um, this is the program by sketching for bit stream streaming programs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> fantastic. Yeah, so yeah. it was really funny because the uh, <laughs> you know, this this was the first paper where we introduced the idea of using partial programs as a way of guiding. Yeah, the, uh, that the was actually going to be process. And, yeah, that was going to be my next question: is how did you? Uh, get to sketch. How did you, how did you go from bit twiddling to sketch? Which, uh, you know, again, you're known for many things, but I think a lot of people, many of the people that I work with, they say, "Oh, well, let's follow Armando sketch approach and see what we can do with that." So that was kind of was that the segue that got you to dig deep. Yeah. So sketch? so basically, what happened in in that paper, we had uh, we had this very very uh, specialized mechanism that you know works pretty well actually for for these class of programs and give you a lot of flexibility for describing the computation, but it was extremely rigid. Mm. Um, the the whole uh, the, the really the core synthesis part was done by a completely ad hoc search procedure that uh, you know, would turn things into matrices and would do some linear algebra there. And mm. uh, it was really, really specialized for these domain. It was so specialized that I think that paper had like five benchmarks. And I spent like half a year looking for a sixth program that I could possibly implement using my system. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it was so rigid that uh, basically any program that I wanted to do was just out of scope. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so then uh, Sanjit Sashia came to, uh, to Berkeley to give his uh, job talk about uh, his work on uh, uh, essentially SMT solving. And um, I actually uh, missed his, uh, his talk. Oh, but, no. <laughs> uh, uh, but Raz went to the talk. And, mm. uh, and so he, he talked to me afterwards and he said, oh, you know, um, 
that you should uh, you should look up this work it it seems like maybe this is something we could use for uh, essentially to escape these uh, these very uh, uh, specialized uh, search procedure and so we also started talking with uh, with uh, Sanjit after that and uh, and very quickly what we realized was that well it wasn't quite so easy because the problem that we're trying to solve if you state it formally it has this quantifier alternation hmm. that uh, because you are looking for a program that works you're looking for the existence of a program that works for all inputs so right so you have this, right, right. Uh, exist for all problem that uh, you know was just different from from the kind of problem that uh, um, that he uh, uh, that standard SMT solvers could solve, and mm -hmm. there there were at the time solvers that uh, purported to solve um, problems with quantifier alternations, but they were not very efficient. Mm -hmm. And uh, after uh, actually after a few hours of brainstorming, uh, the the three of us um, we. Uh, we came up with uh, with this idea of well, what if instead of trying to solve it in one shot, we try to solve it iteratively, and uh, and so you know we try solving it for some inputs and then we check it, and uh, and so I built a prototype for that. Uh, actually, it it was probably a week or two for you know just building the first prototype and and trying it out, and uh, and it seemed like it could work. And uh, and so from there it was now okay so so it seems like we can do this now how do we design a language around this uh, around this idea right and right. how do we uh, how do we leverage it for for other uh, yeah how do you actually uh, go beyond an algorithm and really build a, a language and and a program synthesis methodology around this. And basically that uh, turned into my thesis. That's great. Yeah, and, uh, and you know, as you probably know better than anyone else, one of, the, one of the foremost challenges as I understand it for program synthesis uh, based on, you know, various different ways of synthesizing programs is the computational tractability as we start to get larger and larger programs which sometimes seems to be directly related to the size of the vocabulary that's in the programming language. And so we've done some work where we've created these smaller compressed DSLs simply just to bring the number of unique uh, operations down so then we can try to synthesize larger programs. And we did this, for example, with our, for our MLSS uh, Netson paper that we published earlier, earlier this year, I think it has a total of uh, 41 instructions. And it's still, I think, a useful language for manipulating uh, integers and lists of things, but that's basically all it can do. So yeah, very, very interesting stuff. So now let's pivot to what you're teaching at MIT. A as I understand it, uh, you're teaching the three pillars of mach machine programming sort of as a a basis, I think, of your program synthesis course. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how the three pillars sort of fit in the space of program synthesis? And then also possibly the, the potential difference between what machine programming is and what program synthesis is. Sure. So, so I think one of the things that uh, that I really liked about the the framing that we have in the uh, in the three pillars paper is making this very explicit distinction, especially between the intention problem and the invention problem. So traditionally in in program synthesis, there um, you know, there is a big part of the field that basically takes as given a particular form of specification or a particular form of, uh, you know, whether it's input output examples or whether it's uh, uh, pre and post conditions. And, and it's set up then as kind of a horse race of, you know, who can get the, 
the best synthesizer for, for this particular form of specification. And I think there's a lot of value in that work because that's how you get uh, uh, improvements in a lot of the core search uh, algorithms when, when everybody is working around uh, a common interface. But if your goal is really to automate uh, software development, for example, I think there's a lot of scope in terms of actually how you define the problem, right? And really paying attention and being very deliberate about, okay, what does the user actually know, right? What are the things that users already know that they can readily tell us about what they want, about the, the code that they want, about the, the algorithm that they want to generate that can allow us to not have to spend lots and lots of resources rediscovering things that, that the users can readily tell us, right? And can we ask the users, for example, to tell us things in a certain way that can make it much easier to, to build those algorithms? And so I think thinking about the intention problem and how do we really get to the bottom of what users want and thinking about it together with the invention problem of how do we actually discover that code that, that we're looking for, I think is, is really, really useful. And different synthesis techniques work well with different forms of specification. And, and I think we're still in the process of understanding, uh, you know, how do we avoid program synthesis, for example, from just becoming yet another uh, programming language, right? Just another way in which you write code. Um, right, 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 right. Rather yeah. leverage, you know, really leverage the, the reasoning power and the learning power of the machine. There's like this to... really funny PhD comic, I think about this, that you had sent me once where they're, they're coding and the one person says, you know, if, I feel like there should be this better way to express our ideas to the machine, but it needs to be precise and it needs to capture all this stuff. And then I think the one person says, yeah, it's called coding. <laughs> and so I think that, yeah, it's, you make an excellent point is how do we, how do we enable intentionality to be expressed in a way that doesn't become essentially just what we have today? And I, I love the way that you describe that because one of the things I'm most interested in <clears throat> is that separation of intention from those other two pillars. I think that that is in some sense, the key to unlocking so much potential. Like I look at Jonathan Reagan Kelly's Halide programming language as a canonical example of this is what you get when you separate intentionality. And in my discussions with JRK, uh, he sort of openly admits, well, I don't think we quite got it right. There's a little bit of invention that slips over and then that muddles things a little bit. But I think he's very much in line with our thinking in that the power of Halide is, is principally because intentionality is all the user is allowed to express. And because of that, the machine then can do these incredible things for invention and adaptation that traditional programming languages, which bizarrely provide the programmer with too much power to over specify like system level details or ecosystem details or specific just implementation details of something that then binds it to a certain computational class that then it can't reason about and lift the semantics out to say actually if, if it could reason about the semantics could say I know what you're trying to do here but I'll, I can rewrite this like three orders of magnitude faster uh, so yeah, I absolutely love that. And uh, I, yeah, obviously, you know, you, I, I kind of think of you and I as, uh, you know, the driving fat force behind getting that paper out. And it was probably one of the, the funnest papers that I've worked on, uh, you know, spending many late nights, <laughs> you and I just, okay, okay, I'm going to do this hour long pass. So I send it back over. What about, I change this and we eventually are converging, but it's, it's a wonderful to see that that's part of your uh, MIT program synthesis course. 
So the one other question that I'd like to ask is, so I think you've sort of explained how the pillars fit in to program synthesis. Can you explain in your view what the difference between program synthesis and machine programming is? Or if there is any difference? I tend to think about program synthesis as focusing more on the algorithmic problem of here is, uh, you know, how do we generate uh, this code automatically? How do we solve this huge combinatorial search problem? But I think when, when I think about machine programming, that is talking more broadly about these, uh, this question of, of how do we build programming systems around these capabilities? Right, and how do we actually bring in uh, learning, and how do we bring in questions about user interaction, and how do we bring in notions of software engineering, for example, to to right. make sure that uh, that things are are maintainable. You know, one of the things I I mentioned before that one of the risks is that you know synthesis becomes just another. Uh, just another compiler, right? For for just another uh, language. Yeah. I think there is the the alternate risk that that this just becomes like a parlor game, right? And uh, you know, you roll the dice, and, and maybe you get what you wanted, <laughs> and maybe you get something that is completely not what you wanted, even though it does everything you said you wanted. Uh, uh, right, right. But it's like working with an evil bureaucrat who uh, <laughs> uh, follows all the instructions to the letter, but somehow it, manages to... It, uh, uh, it, it like fully fulfills exactly your intention. Yeah, but it also decides to do some other things or does exactly what it is you specified. You just specified it completely wrong, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. One of the things I'm really curious about, and I've never asked you this question before, I don't think I have, is what is one of the hardest challenges, scholastic or not, that you've had to overcome in your life? And how did you do it? But, uh, I mean, at, at one level, it, uh, you know, I, I have to say, I have actually been really fortunate that sort of at key moments in, uh, in uh, uh, my life, I've run into uh, people who have really helped me out and uh, who have really uh, uh, provided me with that uh, support and that uh, mentorship. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, as, as much as I'd like to tell a heroic story about, uh, you know, overcoming adversity, I think it, uh, it uh, it really has uh, you know it has helped a lot to uh, to to have had the those uh, key moments of uh, of help you know I would say probably for me one of the toughest things was when I first moved to the U S and yeah. I knew you know I was fifteen at the time and I knew very very little about you know really anything about. Uh, uh, you know how things worked, or 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 anything. And did you it, speak any English at that point? I did speak English, um, okay. although you know I uh, um, I went to uh, I went to a school in in Mexico that was sort of well known for having a good English program, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I dutifully managed to fail multiple. <laughs> 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 I, I used to think, well, you know, everybody speaks Spanish. Uh, why do I need to learn English? Uh, it's, uh, it's actually very reassuring knowing that you've actually failed at something in your life. <laughs> I'm going to probably highlight and be like, this is Armando Solar Lozama has failed at least once in his life. And that's why you're going to want to watch this interview. <laughs> yeah, no, I remember, uh, you know, the, the first few weeks that I was at school, I... Uh, you know, I, I would just uh, get, uh, you know, headaches and get home and just crash from, uh, you know, sort of translating in my head or trying to uh, the, the whole time. Uh, but uh, I guess, uh, you know, as a, as a teenager, you sort of get used to thinking in a different uh, language, you know, probably faster than, uh, 
than it was, for example, for uh, for my mother, who uh, who uh, um, uh, you know, as obviously was older than me. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, I guess it it was a bit of a difficult uh, uh, transition. Um, but uh, but I guess it kind of worked out. I um, I I think I was. Uh, um, uh, I think I was lucky in in many respects of uh, sort of having uh, having people around me who uh, who supported me at uh, at a lot of the right moments, yeah. and uh, I I think it was also fortunate that uh, you know as as much as everything was different, the the thing that was not different was you know math. And and science, yeah, which right. happened to be the things that I really really liked, and uh, and so that uh, that also helped uh, that also helped a lot. And it's my sneaking suspicion, you know, how you were saying that you have this uh, slightly diverse background, right? Because I I was born in the U.S. It's my English is my native language, and so I've was fully engrossed the entire time. So how this country works and areas to stay away from, areas to get involved in, this is something that I've, I've always been taught, right? But I think, um, as you know, I think you're very much the same way as that I'm a huge advocate of diversity and inclusion. And a big reason for that is uh, not just to be politically correct, but it's really, it's my belief that the more diverse the group that you can create, the more likely you are to get better different ideas, where I think if it's all people from just this one category, you may still get great ideas, but you may not get the diversity of ideas. And so I think that yeah, the, the MIT in the United States, we're very lucky <laughs> to have your diversity coming in. So I lied, you know, I, I said there was one more question, but in answering that last one, I'm just very curious about something. So you said you moved here when you were 15, um, but somehow you got into grad school at Berkeley, which is often referred to as like the number one public school in the nation. So how do you go from being really struggling at the age of 15 to ramping up somehow fast enough to where you can get into the PhD program at Berkeley? Well, so I think, uh, you know, when, uh, when I was in high school, I think my high school record was very peculiar because uh, I, uh, I, I did great in all my uh, uh, math and uh, science classes. And and on everything else, I probably uh, almost <laughs> failed. Um, but uh, and so when I actually applied to uh, to college, I uh, I applied to MIT and I got duly uh, turned down. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and then I applied to Texas A and M, and um, or some weeks after I submitted my application. Uh, uh, a classmate of uh, of mine uh, just approached me and said, "Hey, you know, my uh, my dad told me to uh, to give you this envelope, right?" And my first reaction was like, "Oh no, what did I do?" Uh, <laughs> but uh, but it turned out that uh, his uh, his dad was actually in the nuclear engineering department at Texas A and M. He was a professor there, and he said, "Oh, you know, we've." I've heard about you from uh, from my son, and I think you should uh, apply to our uh, department. We also have a lot of scholarships, and so I thought, huh, that that sounds like fun. Uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to so I applied to to get a scholarship from the nuclear engineering department, and uh, <laughs> and so then I get this letter saying, oh, you know, congratulations. We uh, you know we're going to give you this scholarship if you decide to enroll in our uh, in our major. Um, and so I went to the admissions office of the university. It was sort of one of the advantages of being in the same university town. So I went and I said, oh, you know, I got this letter and, uh, you know, I, I had originally asked to, to major in physics, but, you know, uh, nuclear engineering seems close enough. And, uh, and so the person goes and checks and, uh, 
And she says, you know, wait a second. Uh, and then she goes to the back and then I see, you know, lots of motion in the back. And then she comes back and says, well, this is really strange because it says here in the computer that we just turned you down <laughs> from admissions. <laughs> but then you have, you know, this, this letter that says that you were offered a scholarship. And so there must be some mistake here. <laughs> and, and sure enough, um, uh, you know, a day later, I get this letter in the mail saying, well, we're sorry, but, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we're not going to be able to accept you into our program. And, uh, and but, uh, but yeah, it turned out that then the, the people in the nuclear engineering department uh, interceded on my behalf. And, uh, and that's how I got into college. <laughs> oh, that's so great. And then from Texas A&M, then after your undergrad, then you went to Berkeley and, and you went straight into computer science. Is that right? Yeah. So, so what happened was uh, actually... Um, as an international student, uh, there was a, a cap on how many hours you could take for uh, on your first semester, and uh, and uh, and so I had some free time, and so I decided I would sit in on this algorithms class. Um, it uh, you know seemed interesting, and I figured yeah, I'll I'll just sit there and uh, and learn something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this class was really the first time that I saw computer science as more than just, oh, you know, you know how to program and how to use the computer, but to see it really as uh, algorithms, as mathematical objects that you can do formal reasoning on. Right. And, uh, and so right after that, I, uh, I decided that, no, actually, I, I want to be a computer scientist. Yeah, and, that's uh, so great. And... Uh, and so, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's how it happened. It's super fantastic. I, I often say that I have yet to see a mathematical equation that I can't transform into a coded algorithm. And so <laughs> <laughs> any challengers out there that would like to show me something, I, I encourage you to try to come up with that equation that I can't write uh, in, in code. So, but that, that light, that's actually really interesting. I just, the last interview is with Celine Lee, who's a former student of mine. She's doing her PhD at Cornell and her story is actually very similar. She was EE and then she took an algorithms class. And then suddenly she said, wait, this is super interesting. I think I want to be computer science. And so she, she pivoted and uh, Alvin Chung, who, you know, you, you advised, his story is also somewhat similar as he started out as EE and then he switched over to computer science. So it's, it's really fascinating, uh, these little events that happen in our life, right? Uh, so we, we're running past time, but I have just one final question and then I promise I'll let you go. And, sure. <laughs> uh, the last question I have is, you, you, you've been in, incredibly successful in this field and you're one of the few people that I consider as like a personal mentor. You know, like I look at what you're doing. I constantly ask you for advice. What do you think I should do here? Uh, so given that you have achieved so much, what, what maybe single piece of advice would you share with sort of the aspiring up and coming Armando's or young researchers that are probably very inspired by you, see you as the, sort of the superhero, what, what would you kind of impart with them to help them on their journey? Well, I mean, I, I guess there's a, lot, uh, <laughs> there's a lot to cover, but, but I think if there was one thing, I would say, um, you know, one of the things that is, uh, uh, most rewarding about research is this ability to really be able to dive into a problem, to understand for, for the sake of understanding. And, uh, uh, and, and I think it is, it is a great opportunity that we have as, uh, as researchers to, to be able to do this and, and to have the freedom and, and the flexibility to just jump into problems and to really dive deeply and say, I want to figure out 
how this works. I want to figure out what's uh, what's behind this. And and I think as a researcher, sometimes it's a little bit easy to get caught up in the mm. oh, you know, we we need to get the paper in, or we need to uh, you know get the grant in. And and I think it's really important to to never lose sight of you know at the end of the day why why we're doing this right and uh, and you know to to really not lose the focus on the you know what's what's really important about our role in society which is really you know discovering a new new knowledge uh everything right. else is is sort of ancillary to 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 this primary goal yeah absolutely and uh, just two final comments about that is that answer is very similar to what Alvin Chung shared is he said it was, I think if I'm recalling correctly, it was once he became a professor, he finally for the first time started to deeply understand research and not focus just about the next paper, but instead to pivot and say, why are we doing this? What, what is the benefit? Is this the right problem for us to focus on? Uh, are we doing more harm than good? Like what, what is sort of the driving factor here? And then I think, as you know, a big reason why I am so excited about machine programming is going back to your example, when you were 15, uh, I was just looking at this data last night because I gave a talk at ETH Zurich uh, yesterday and I, I didn't know the number. Um, based on what I saw, there's something like 780 million people globally that are illiterate. And we have a global population of 7.8 billion people. So we basically have 10% of the population that can't read or write. And that's really, really unfortunate. But the, the upside of that is we have 90% that can, right? And I think that's fantastic. But now if we pivot that story and instead have it be about creating software, what we see is according to the data that I've seen, we have approximately 27 million programmers globally. But again, 7.8 billion people, that means we have approximately 0.3% of the global population that is code literate. That means we have 99.7% that is essentially illiterate. And that's something that I think we need to fix that people like you and I who understand the field and can find ways to allow other humans to express their ideas to the machine and these brilliant people, you know, they have all these amazing ideas, but they just simply can't communicate through code. And so uh, when, when I think about what you just said, this is one of the things that I constantly think about is that's one of the driving forces for me. So Armando, thank you so much for being on the channel. It's such a delight. This is the second time I've interviewed you, uh, but we got into much deeper territory, I think, with this one. Are there any final comments that you'd like to share before we adjourn for today? No, just, you know, thanks. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to, uh, uh, to be here. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I really appreciate all the, all the kind words too. Yeah, absolutely. Our, our pleasure. Thank you so much, Romano. All right. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.